Hello and welcome. My name is Madhuri Jha, my pronouns are she, hers, and I am the director of the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity, an entity of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. It is my sincere pleasure to be your host and moderator and welcome you to today's event, Embedding Equity into 988, the Leadership Summit. Next month on July 16th, 988 will become the new National Mental Health Crisis Emergency Line, replacing the Suicide Prevention Lifeline and fostering an opportunity to ensure that someone experiencing a mental health crisis is met with the response that is appropriate and adequate for the need. The Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity prioritizes the advancement of equity in our behavioral health system through, through thoughtful and comprehensive approaches to research, policy, and leadership convening. Founded by Dr. David Satcher, 16th Surgeon General of the United States, and Congressman Patrick J. Kennedy, the author of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, our center has been at the helm of leading national dialogue around the importance of evidence-based solutions to advancing equity for all. 988 is a new frontier in healthcare. Our previous emergency structures were not able to meet the needs of our most vulnerable. And unfortunately, the responses to this have been met with outcomes that are traumatizing and fatal. For certain populations, these outcomes are significantly worse. With sponsorship from Beacon Health Options, the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity has prioritized ensuring that equity is a foundational premise for 98's successful launch. Many of you are here today because you read the policy brief we released last week with the same title, Embedding Equity into 988. Our team of scholars conducted a comprehensive literature review, which informed the development of an IRB-approved survey that was distributed to dozens of leaders in the behavioral health space for response. That survey asked our respondents to tell us what facets of an emergency response system would ensure that it is equitable. What this process also did for us was ensure that we could identify key populations that require specific attention to detail, so outcomes are positive and constructive. These populations are, but not limited to, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, LGBTQIA plus communities, rural communities, immigrants, refugees, and non-English speaking people, people living with disabilities, older adults, people experiencing homelessness or housing instability, formerly incarcerated or justice involved populations, survivors of trauma, and neurodiverse people. Today's leadership convening is to complement that report with diverse representation of the voices necessary to ensure 988 is an equitable success. You are tuning in today to a unique meeting of the minds. We are featuring expert panelists and speakers from the White House, SAMHSA, leading organizations, leaders of lived experience, all of whom carry important roles in advancing equity in behavioral health. I truly hope that you all can take away concrete ideas, inspiration, and solutions to ensure that 988 is an equitable success wherever you are joining us from. With that, the structure for today will be as follows. Our leadership here at Morehouse School of Medicine and Beacon Health Options will be kicking us off with some welcome remarks. We will take a short break to queue up our senior leadership roundtable, which will run for one hour. And then we will have a series of individual keynotes who will provide us with the specific insight necessary to walk away from the summit feeling empowered in our roles as equity leaders. As you know, you will notice our amazing team of ASL interpreters that will be visible in the corner of this screen. This presentation will be recorded and available for viewing in both Spanish and English after today's live stream on our YouTube channel. In advance, I thank you all for choosing to make equity a priority in your work and joining us today. I hope today is a meaningful launching pad for this to, be welc to become a collective of all of our important voices as we work together to create the system that I believe we have the potential to see through successfully. Our first welcome keynote joining us today is our founder, David, Dr. David Satcher. He will be followed up by the Executive Director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, Daniel Dawes, and then we will have a brief welcome from the CEO of Beacon Health Options, Glenn McFarland. After that, a short break, and then our roundtable. Thank you. In 2001, when I was serving as Surgeon General, I presented at the American Psychological Association's annual meeting. There, and at that time, I said, the main message of my report on mental health is that culture counts. It should echo through the corridors and communities of this nation. That was true 21 years ago, but it's still true today. Although this nation has made progress in the field of mental health, we continue to fail at embedding culture diversity, and equity into understanding how to support all citizens 
with their mental health. It's long overdue for us to start focusing on how to make our crisis response structures more equitable. With the launch of 988, it is imperative that we start recognizing that culture is rooted into who we are as a nation and cannot be ignored when we're trying to save lives. I'm grateful and proud of all of us gathered here today to give voice to this very important issue. And I hope today's dialogue, along with this crucial policy brief that is published, will push us toward ensuring 988 is more equitable than 911. I want to thank our partner, Beacon Health Options, for their support and enthusiasm for publishing this policy brief and hosting the summit with us. Your partnership and genuine passions to move toward having more, having more equitable response system is much appreciated. As I said 21 years ago, and I'm still saying it today, supporting the mental health of ethnic and racial minority groups is critical to advancing our nation's welfare, just critical. So thank you all for being here today, and I welcome everyone to this virtual summit for this important dialogue. It is indeed a really important and critical dialogue. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Dawes, and I'm the executive director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you all today to the Embedding Equity into 988 Leadership Summit, where we will have forward-moving conversations for this critical moment in history. The speakers at this summit represent the diversity in leadership necessary to actualize embedding equity into policy. Along with structural and institutional barriers to health equity, inequity in our crisis response system has long been neglected and resulted in more harm and trauma for many, including many populations historically underreached by our healthcare system. The study of mental health equity is a priority here at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute because, as Dr. Satcher said in the first Surgeon General report on mental health, there is no health without mental health. You see, I often speak about the political determinants of health, and today it is valuable for us to recognize how this framework applies to mental health specifically. The political determinants of health are the instigators, the creators of the structural conditions and the social drivers that affect the overall dynamics of health and well-being. What we have been able to discern through this lens is that the political determinants of mental health extend far beyond the walls of a hospital or clinic, and when met with poor response, the walls of a carceral facility. 988 represents a new frontier to thoughtfully craft public health response to crisis. This can only be achieved by having the very difficult conversations with leaders in society at all levels who hold the power to take actionable steps toward responding and resolving such inequities. The policy brief that was, re that was released last week has set the foundation with realistic and actionable recommendations that can ensure 988 response is more equitable than 911. I'm grateful for the work that has been done to present this policy brief and believe the recommendations can have incredible impact and ensuring equity is embedded into the launch and long-term execution of 988. Until health systems and public agencies come to realize that the health of the nation is interconnected to politics and policy, we will not advance much further and may have the potential to regress even if we leave these political determinants unchecked. You see, the political determinants of health involve the systematic process of structuring relationships, distributing resources, and administering power, and they operate simultaneously in ways that mutually reinforce or influence one another to shape opportunities that either advance or hinder health equity. You see, when it comes to our community members, 
there are no second chances to get it right. So we need to start 988 equitably. As I wrap up, I'd like to thank Beacon for their partnership and their partnership really in helping us put together this policy brief and hosting this important event. The beauty of this summit is that we, that we all are gathered here today to actually have the difficult conversations needed with leaders in our society at all levels, who hold the power to address the inequities in our crisis response system, and specifically our psychiatric crisis response. I hope the power and presence of everyone here today will move us to ensure that 988 is met with equity and dignity for all. Thank you all so much for the privilege of your time. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Embedding Equity in 988 Leadership Summit. As mentioned, my name is Glenn McFarland, and I'm the President and CEO for Beacon Health Options. We hold the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity in high esteem, and it is an honor and a privilege for Beacon to have been part of this process. 988 offers us great hope that individuals experiencing a mental health crisis will receive the same level of care of those experiencing a medical emergency. As we look to ensure the mental health response is on par with that of medical emergencies, it is vital that we help communities build a better crisis systems based on a foundation of equity and capability of responding to the unique needs and experiences of individuals. Beacon has been working closely with states to elevate the level of care they are able to provide through responsive crisis programs. Beacon's team of experts includes individuals with clinical and lived experiences to support people in crisis in communities across the country working collaboratively to identify and address public health needs and build capacity of local resources. We're eager to start receiving the recommendations set forth in the policy brief released by the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity and working with communities we serve on putting them into practice. With that, I am really thrilled to hear the discussions that come from today's summit Thank you all for joining and participating today. Take care. We will be taking a quick break to get our panelists set up so that they can start the leadership roundtable. Please be on standby for a few minutes and we'll be back with you shortly.
All right, welcome everyone. Um, for those who've joined us a little bit later and reintroducing myself, my name is Madhuri Ja, I'm the director of the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity, and I am your host and moderator for today's Leadership Summit. You've tuned in for this segment of our broadcast, which is our Senior Leadership Roundtable, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to the esteemed speakers that we have invited to be a part of this today. We made concerted efforts to invite needed and diverse voices to tackle critical questions on embedding equity into 988. One unfortunate news is that Dr. Miriam Dolphin Rittman is unfortunately unwell and we wish her a speedy recovery. And so she will be having her chief of staff, Sonia Chesson, join in for us. In no particular order, I, it's my pleasure to introduce you to former Congressman and founder of the Kennedy Satcher Center, Patrick J. Kennedy. Sonia Chesson, Chief of Staff of SAMHSA. Dr. Warren Ng, President of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Dr. Linda Henderson-Smith, Senior Product Management Director at Beacon Health Options. And last but certainly not least, Terry Tanelian, Special Assistant to President Biden on Veterans Affairs. Welcome to all of you. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for this powerful discussion. You all look wonderful. Um, I'm so grateful that you took time to be a part of this incredible moment, and I am really looking forward to our conversation. Some notes on structure and flow as we go through the questions. I ask you all to think about your role as it relates to 988 and how you feel your role will contribute to the advancement of equity and its implementation. As I state at all of our leadership convenings here at Kennedy Satcher Center, I also encourage you to channel your own identity and how it influences sustained success in your work. You may simply raise your hand like this um, to be looped into a question directed to one of your peers as you feel inspired to respond to each other. My hope is that this is a constructive and robust dialogue between us. A reminder as well that you'll notice in your, in your screen as speakers, but as well to our audience, that we have an amazing ASL interpreter that will be live uh, in the corner of the screen, making this presentation accessible to our attendees with audio needs. Audience members, you have a chat function uh, that you can utilize to respectfully engage with each other. We have asked you to submit questions ahead of time with your registration, which time permitting, we will be able to respond to with our panelists. Um, but with that, if there are not any questions from our speakers, I'd like us to begin. So I, the first question is open to all of you, um, as I think it sets a framework for us. So please chime in as you feel as you would like to add to your colleagues' answers. Um, Sonia, on behalf of Dr. Delphin Rittman and leadership at SAMHSA, I'd like to start with you. How would you define equity and what does equity mean to you? I'm I'm sorry, I'm, you're coming in and out a little bit for me, so I don't know if you are for other folks as well, but I understand the question to be how, to, how I would define equity. Um, I think we define it um, certainly at the federal level as the consistent, fair, and just treatment of all individuals, including those who belong to underserved communities that have been denied such treatment, um, which includes Black, Latino, and Indigenous, Native American people, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and other persons of color, LGBTQ plus individuals, people with disabilities, um, and people otherwise adversely impacted by persistent poverty or inequality. And for me, I believe we can't have a just society uh, until every American has access to high quality and culturally sensitive health care and mental health care is health care. The crisis system can be a gateway to, the, to behavioral health care. So we really must ensure that um, we correct the historic inequities at that first point of contact if we're going to create uh, equity throughout the entire system. Absolutely, and I think that's a good starting point for us. Patrick, always great to see you as part of our leadership here at Kennedy Satcher Center and one of my closest advisors. Tell us how over your uh, years of work in mental health advocacy, um, how equity has informed where you are today and, and why you feel equity is needed in our discussion. Well, th thank you, Madhuri, and thank you all, uh, panel who have joined us, and uh, uh, especially uh, our friends at Beacon for sponsoring. I wanna go to what Dr. Satcher was uh, saying, because Dr. Satcher and himself, before he uh, emphasized uh, inequities within the mental health system, he was fighting, within it, fighting inequities within our society. I mean, he was jailed with Dr. King, he was one of those um, 
students uh, who help change the course of history in this country to open up the circle of opportunity for more Americans of color. And, you know, we've done some great work with voting rights, fair housing, fair employment, civil rights. We need to take that sort of template that this is not going to be a one and done just because we passed parity, which says that we can no longer treat mental health separate and unequally to overall health and the way we reimburse it and treat it and the like. We now need to make sure that in itself, mental health is respectful and has parity within mental health as is that it's also integrated into overall health. So uh, thank you, Madhuri, and to Daniel Dawes and the whole team over at Satcher Health Leadership and the Kennedy Satcher Center. Um, this is the time to really tackle this because I can't tell you the number of times that we've all experienced these terrible tragedies of a kind of uh, incarceral kind of law enforcement response to mental health crises that um, where people get killed because they uh, the, the responders do not have cultural competence to what it's like to live with a, a mental health diagnosis. But we know also if they don't have a cultural competence and they're responding to a crisis within a um, community of color and they do not look like the community they're responding to, there's also evidence of, of systemic kind of a racial uh, bias that also ends up in these becoming tragedies. So really 988 represents a, a, a multiple of opportunities to both correct the unjust response from a criminal justice system that is not equipped to deal with a mental health crisis, but it also helps us address um, the, the whole idea of having a culturally competent first responder crisis responder who, who looks like the community that they're responding to. Because a combination of both of those can save countless lives. And it's really important, as was said by uh, Daniel Dawes, that we get it right the first time uh, because there are lives on the line. And, and thank you, Madhuri, for your leadership in getting this dialogue going because we have to do this prior to 988 getting stood up. And and thank you, Terry Tenillion, for helping through the White House make sure that this gets done the right way. Um, this is a historic opportunity. It's going to be a challenge, but we're we're working at this right now, which is when we should be doing it. You said a lot there that's really important to set a framework for our discussion. And I want to pull in our other colleagues. Dr. Ng, I see your hand going up. So please tell us your perspective on equity, why it's important, why it's an urgent discussion for us. And I'll pull in our other panelists as well to follow up. Thank you, Madhuri. And thank you so much for hosting this important forum. And Honorable Patrick Kennedy, thank you so much, as well as Dr. David Satcher, to really lead off this dialogue, which is so critical. And one of the things that I would say with regards to that really grounding question around equity, it's really acknowledging our unique richness and diversity and understanding that those differences actually are a critical part of our shared journey. So if our destination is health and well being, then it's acknowledging that our unique differences that we have different journeys along the way and being able to support each of us in our unique journey towards our shared destination of health and well-being is so important. So from a framework, I think of equity as really acknowledging our uniqueness as well as the fact that we can bring more to each other, but also the fact that we come to this journey from different places um, within and without and being able to acknowledge that System, systems and structures are um, inherently inequitable because they're not designed for everyone, but we can do that now. I think as Honorable Patrick Kennedy shared, this is an opportunity to really create a new system that is more just. And so I'm just so excited to be sharing this space with all of you. Absolutely. And I, I like your reference to uniqueness and diversity. I think folks who have started to follow our work here have noticed that that's a big priority of mine as well. You all are diverse in your own identity and how you've presented today, but as well represent such important leadership roles in the way that we frame our conversation and how we're going to tackle it. 
Um, Linda, I'd like to pull you in too, as well as Terry, you know, if you could speak to priorities that are necessary in the current response structure and how, how equity can create this new frontier that everyone's talking about. Um, Linda, we'll come to you and then Terry, I'd like you to, to chime in as well. Definitely. Thank you um, for having me um, and thank you all for being here. This is really awesome. But to, to build on what Dr. Ng said, I think one of the things that for me equity means, right, is around access. Access to the resources that people need um, in the way that they need them, right, in tailored unique ways so that they can live their fullest potential and their fullest lives. Um, or as some people say, want, right, to live to the fullest potential. And so for us, in, or for me, in 988, it's really about making sure that people have access to the resources that are necessary um, in order to do that, whatever that means for them, right? Whether that's around their different cultural makeups, um, where they live, having access to mental health providers instead of law enforcement, if it's not necessary, right? Like those are, those are, key resources that are necessary in order to make an equitable system um, so that as uh, Patrick said, right, so that people can actually have a response similar to what we would see from a medical side, right? We don't just send just the fire department. We send an ambulance, a fire department, police officer, right? Like whoever they're needed is needed to, to deal with that. And so for me, it's about having an equitable access to those resources. Yeah, absolutely. Terry, um, from the office of the president in your critical role, you have a diverse experience as well, just as a specialist in, in vulnerable populations. Tell us what equity means in your role and how can that set a framework for the perspective you'll bring to us today? Sure, and thank you, Madhuri, so much for the opportunity to be with you. It's great to be with this esteemed panel to talk about a very important topic. I think, as Sonia mentioned, you know, kind of ensuring that we have capabilities that are fair and just is really essential. And, you know, kind of ensuring that we are doing all we can to build the capabilities and the foundation to ensure that we not only get rid of the disparities and access that may exist but that we ensure that people have the services and uh, access to resources to meet their needs. You know, as a mom, um, trying to explain to my kids when they were little, what I um, meant by equity was really ensuring that they understood it's about making sure people have what they need to thrive and that that's not always a one size fits all approach. It's really making sure that we understand the unique needs um, the cultural sensitivity that may be needed in the way that we respond, being trauma-informed, and ensuring that we're meeting people where they are to deliver the services that can help them gain access um, to resources, to treatments, um, but to really the services that are going to help them thrive. And so from my perspective, it's really ensuring that we are working across the federal government, across the landscape, to kind of build a robust, comprehensive approach to being able to serve people in mental health crisis. So at the Kennedy Satcher Center, we try to focus on what I call concepts of visibility and invisibility and try to ensure that our language choice is also inclusive of making sure we're uplifting the visibility of groups that have not been represented historically in our resources. Um, so I'll just provide a reframe for our audience in case someone joined late that I, I presented earlier. In this policy brief, our, our research identified specific populations that need to be prioritized with 988 um, to ensure that we are rectifying negative outcomes that our current response structures have perpetuated due to inadequate resources and organization. So I'm going to restate what those are, and I'd like us to thoughtfully talk through how we can think about impacting these groups po um, positively. That's Black and Indigenous people of color, LGBTQIA plus folks, rural communities, immigrants, refugees, and non-English speaking people, people living with disabilities, older adults, people experiencing homelessness or housing instability, formerly incarcerated or justice involved populations, survivors of trauma, and neurodiverse people. And yet we know that this is still not completely inclusive of many other identities also in need. I'd like us to take some thoughtful time to talk through how 988 can be a change uh, agent for these populations that have been met with the most adverse outcomes. Um, Dr. Henderson-Smith, I'll start with you. 
You're a clinical and technical expert working in crisis management and crisis collaboration. Um, how can 988 be the difference for historically invisible groups? I think the, the number one kind of difference, at least from my perspective, right? As a mother who has children who have behavioral health concerns, um, I, I would say the number one is actually getting them the mental health support. So access to clinicians, access to peers, um, that can actually help de-escalate, talk to them, get them to understand potentially what may be going on with them and get them the support. I think it can help destigmatize the mental health system, but can also change the response. Right now, unfortunately, as we talked about, right, untrained law enforcement is possibly the ones that are going in. And as Patrick said, that has that has ended in some some fatalities that weren't necessarily due to safety reasons. And so I do think that one of the hugest changes is the access component to destigmatizing behavioral health support that they wouldn't and haven't necessarily gotten in the past. Excellent. And I think, you know, the issues of stigma and mistrust are important, right? We want to ensure that people feel comfortable calling 988 and recognize that 988 will be a help to them. Um, Dr. Ng, you are first and foremost a psychiatrist and a leading, you know, advisor to many hospitals across the country in child and adolescent psychiatry. Um, you know, and one thing I often highlight, which was alarming to me in, in doing the research that uh, informed our report, is that 75% of the United States counties are designated as clinician shortage sites, um, which means they simply don't have the services. You know, tell us what this means for our workforce. You know, if we imagine an equitable crisis response in your perspective as a leader in psychiatry. Thank you so much, Madhuri. And we definitely um, are, you know, experiencing a national crisis of mental health and behavioral health access um, and services. And as a child and adolescent psychiatrist and physician expert in children's mental health, um, these are things that we experience every single day, and we definitely appreciate that there's been such a crisis that three organizations, our organization, American Academy of Child Analysis and Psychiatry and American Academy of Pediatrics and Children's Hospital Association, declared a national state of emergency last year. Um, and we are very encouraged, I think, with the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Bunce, in terms of protecting youth mental health advisory. And I think that that advisory um, really spelled out the fact that it's going to take all of us in order to respond. And it isn't any one segment of our care or social fabric that needs to be mended. I think we need to be all in this. And I think that that speaks to the stigma issues. There are a lot of barriers that keep people from receiving care. And that's why I think the work of Honorable Patrick Kennedy, as well as David Satcher, no health without mental health, is really a key factor. And whether or not we're law enforcement or anyone else, if we don't see that mental health is a part of our overall health and well-being, and the overall part of who someone is, um, I think that's really critical. I think from the workforce perspective, and thank you so much for bringing that up, it's really thinking about child and adolescent psychiatrists as a part of a treatment team and a physician-led team to really contribute to that solution. And of course, it's partnering with our youth, our communities, um, particularly our underserved and really more underrepresented communities to be a part of the solution together. And that's part of the Surgeon General's advisory. But when we think about mental health um, providers as well as child and adolescent psychiatrists, you're right, about 70, 75% of all counties in the United States don't have a child and adolescent psychiatrist. That's why we work collaboratively with our teams, your psychologists, social workers, nurse practitioners, pediatricians, as well as all of our community in terms of partnering with that response. And I'm just saying that we all have a unique role and contribution to that solution. And I think having a diverse workforce is equally important, which is really highlighted in the wonderful brief, because what we need to also understand is cultural competence, cultural humility, as well as an acknowledgement that we are, in, we have implicit bias. We're going to see the anyone else through our own eyes, but we can also sharpen our lens. We can also learn to see the differences and acknowledge that we are not all the same, but that we can use our shared humanity to understand that other people 
feel and suffer just as we do. Um, however, we can be understanding and appreciative of how we can lessen that suffering by acknowledging their unique differences and that they may need different approaches that are culturally informed, trauma informed, as well as respective of their gender or sexuality experience um, so that we can make them feel cared for. And I love that Maya Angelou quote that, you know, people may not remember what you said or what they, they, you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And that's what we're really invested in, is helping people feel cared for, understood, seen, and heard. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's interesting. I'm, I'm a therapist just two nights a week still. And I have found even in this moment that we're in through COVID-19, I have found myself being more okay, being vulnerable with my own clients. I really liked the reference you made to uh, empowering our own humanity of those of us that are in leadership and, and what that looks like. And it's really powerful for you all to be able to speak to that as well. Um, you know, from a national leadership perspective, Patrick, Sonia, Terry, tell us, you know, about why, you know, to these specific groups that have been grossly neglected by our system, unfortunately, why we can ensure equity is a priority and how we can do that. Um, Sonia, maybe I'll come to you and then I'd love Terry and Patrick to, to chime in too. All right, the inevitable unmute. Um, I, I, I think I really wanted to build on what Dr. Henderson Smith said about ensuring access, um, which is really at the core of our response. In general, ensuring equitable access to mental health and substance use service is, is one of is sort of one of Dr. Delphin Rittman's top priorities. It's probably her top priority. And I, I need to again reiterate um, how sad she was that she could not join uh, this morning because this is really something that's so very core and central to her work. Um, but it is, it is a, a priority for SAMHSA. And we're really hoping that 988 will broaden access to crisis services in communities across the country. Um, and that key to its success is going to be uh, the, its ability to reach vulnerable and marginalized communities. Um, I, the Kennedy Satcher Center's recent report um, indicates that over 90% of response, respondents reported that the current US psychiatric emergency response system is not equitable. I mean, these are very significant statistics and suggest that we really have a long road ahead of us, but we need to be intentional about this. You know, we are, we are um, uh, I don't wanna say overwhelmed, but we, we are the magnitude of the, of the, of the um, opportunity that 988 has afforded us to make really, really significant changes in the system has not gone um, unnoticed. And we are very, very focused on building a system of entities, public and private working together to be sure that we meet our, our country's growing behavioral health crisis needs, obviously have been made even worse by the pandemic. So this is gonna require that we shore up all of the crisis call centers and that's why SAMHSA and um, this administration has put $282 million um, into funding our crisis um, call centers, which is a tenfold increase from last year's funding and it's really essential. But we aren't stopping here um, when it comes to 988 equitable access is critical um, and not just to the crisis centers, but to all crisis services. So SAMHSA is working in lockstep with HHS and the White House to ensure that we build support for um, all of these communities across the whole continuum. We can talk more um, as, uh, about the specifics of how we're reaching out as we move forward. Yeah, and it, it needs to be said that we've never had this much investment in mental health, right? And, and that that budget went from $3 billion to about $12 billion, I believe, in the past couple of years, which is huge and really, really important. So, you know, Terry, tell us a bit about, you know, what you're feeling when you're hearing your colleagues and how it translates to your role. And, and Patrick, I'll ask you to speak on just what the advocacy coalition building movement, you know, we have hundreds of people signed in right now can do to ensure that this remains a, a priority for all of us moving forward. So Terry, I'll, I'll go to you first. Sure, I think as you know, has been said, 988 provides us with a unique opportunity, um, as challenging as it is to really ensure that we are building a system that works for everyone and that we're using the funding and resources wisely to ensure that we not just have representation of those individuals and in those communities that have historically 
been underserved and marginalized, um, but that we are also delivering services that meet their unique needs. And, you know, as focused as we are on 988, and that being perhaps for many, the gateway to needed mental health and substance use services, we're also really focused on ensuring that we are looking beyond crisis services to look at how we are transforming the entire mental health and substance use systems. For many of uh, the panelists here, as well as many of the audience members recognize this is decades long um, of a challenge in terms of our ability to transform how we address mental health, how we integrate mental health and substance use services, not just into primary care settings, but into other healthcare settings and non-healthcare settings to ensure that we are meeting people's needs where they are and so that we can get upstream so that not just do we wanna make sure that someone who is well-trained and equipped to answer the phone when someone is in crisis and that we have capable, culturally sensitive and appropriate uh, responders who may uh, go to where that individual is in need or bring them to a crisis stabilization facility. We also need to make sure that we have a mental health and substance use treatment system um, that has the capability and capacity to be able to deliver high quality mental health and substance use services. And that is gonna take significant investment now and well into the future. Um, as the president outlined in his FY23 budget, we are calling for historic investments in increasing the size and the diversity of the mental health and substance use workforce, thinking not just about specialists like Dr. Um, Ng, and we do need more child and adolescent psychiatrists as well as other specialists, but we also need to focus on the broad continuum of providers who we know can be very helpful in connecting people to the services they may need. We're investing more in trying to get more school counselors, psychologists, and bringing mental health services into schools and thinking about how we can also innovate and transform the way in which people access services. As Patrick knows, we're really focused on shoring up and strengthening Perry. We need to hold insurers and plans accountable to the current law, but also continue to expand and ensure that um, all health plans offer a robust uh, suite of behavioral health services so that we can meet people's needs. And so just as 988 is an opportunity, we are thinking be behind 988 and beyond 988 to build a system, again, that will work for everyone. Excellent. And I think one thing I'm thinking of is what Patrick always says is, you know, that getting to this point means that you think about these things like a marathon and not a sprint. You know, and Patrick, from your perspective, how do we sustain this momentum? Right. I think equity is such a priority now in so many different facets of our life. Um, for good reason, you know, tell us from your perspective as a testament to the work that you and Dr. Satcher have been doing for years, you know, how do we sustain this momentum? Well, I think it's first going, important to go back and look at systemic racism and the destructive aspects of prejudice in this country. And, you know, when my uncle was the first president addressed civil rights as a moral issue of his time, people were impervious to it. And if they were in the majority, if they were white. And he said, who amongst us would be willing to trade the color of their skin and be content with those who counsel patients and delay? Kind of like Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. I think this is a big deal. Try walking in my shoes. So we have entrenched uh, discrimination and we're unaware of it because it's. And I think it's important to think about the golden rule treat others as you yourself would like to be treated. So people are like wondering, well, why is this important to me? Well, think about the fact that our criminal justice system incarcerates more people than any, as a percentage of the population, than any other free country in the world. That's an indictment on us in terms of our crisis response in this country. Think about the fact that a disproportionate percentage of those people are, com are from communities of color and think about the fact that our criminal justice system has become a default for a lack of a mental health and addiction treatment system. Those are historic injustices. So to correct that, going back to Daniel's point about political determinants, this isn't an accident, Madhuri. The point of this meeting is to make sure we're conscious, one, and then we're intentional, intentional about shifting this. And that means don't talk the talk, but fail to walk the walk. 
put your money where your mouth is. Now, with our parity law, we were very specific when regulating private insurers, inpatient in-network, outpatient in-network, inpatient out-of-network, outpatient out-of-network, pharmacy and ER had to be the same as what you would do with cancer, diabetes, and other physical surgical issues. Now, are we there? Not even close. And I want to thank Anth Anthem and Beacon for again stepping up. We, I wish more payers would take their lead and step up. Instead, we have payers like United in this WIT decision who are substituting their own medical management criteria for those generally accepted. Now, if this were cancer, there would be a revolt on every company in this country that used United as their third party administrator. Politically, there'd be a revolt. They'd say, no way you can do that. So why are we accepting it? It's because, again, we are steeped in denial. I know that denial. I'm a person in recovery. It's the big thing you have to overcome. But to overcome it, you have to have insight, meaning you have to know where you've been delusional in your thinking. As a country, we don't have that insight because if we did, we would be not accepting of the fact that, okay, we apply parity to private insurance, but what about applying parity to government budgets? Medicare is not parity compliant. Medicaid fee for service, not parity compliant. DOD, our veterans and our military are not afforded the same guarantees as we guarantee through our private insurance. So, you know, I, I love to go after accountability on insurers, but let's be honest, Uncle Sam is not accountable to parity, is not compliant to parity. So if we're going to switch this, we need to invest and make up these historic disparities. And we do that through a number of ways that we're going to be demonstrating through this series and your leadership, Madhuri, because I think for the advocacy community, we need to have insight on all the things that we need. Now, do we have sufficient number of people to answer the calls? Well, not when all of the big telecom providers are failing to provide the same payment for this crisis response as they do 911. What's wrong with parity there? Why are all the big telecom companies backing away. That is intolerable. That needs to be changed. And again, why are major uh, payers like United failing to pay for mental health providers because they have a lack of in-network benefit and just blaming it on Dr. Ng and his colleagues for, for going out of network? I guarantee Dr. Ng and his colleagues would stay in network if uh, there were Blue Cross Blue Shield plans like Massachusetts where Andrew Dreyfus has deliberately increased the reimbursement rate for child and adolescent psychiatrists. Why aren't, you know, Andrew Dreyfus's colleagues around the country doing the same? What we're seeing in many payers is not that. We're seeing them pay more for, you know, the fact we don't have enough nurses. Thank God we're trying to improve costs for primary care docs. But the, what we're not seeing is them pay more for behavioral health. And so all I'm pointing out here, Madhuri, is we need enforcement of equality. Now, we need to fight discrimination. Essentially, this is not only about fighting for equity. It's also about condemning and not being satisfied with discrimination. Because understand what Daniel said, political determinants. We have made value judgments in government that say, that this is not valuable. Like, and when we make that de decision, it's not an accident that people in communities of color, people with mental illness, people on the margins do not get treated the same. It is a direct result of society's acceptance of a double standard in terms of access to, to the same resources that they would never accept if it were cancer in the case of med surge, or if it were in the, uh, a different colored skin in the case of racial disparity. So this is where we need to keep the frame very high level if we're to understand how to move forward.
There's a lot to take in from what you just said and the power of reciprocity and understanding as well, the, the, the value of the many roles that we need to regard with higher visibility in terms of equitable crisis response. Um, I'll highlight for our panel that you know our research as well, survey, survey respondents highlighted a need to prioritize some key professional titles as part of effective mobile crisis that are not traditionally accounted for. And that included medical interpreters, peer specialists and engagement with community leaders to bridge gaps in communities that are characterized by mistrust in the medical system. Um, you know, and I think one thing that I've heard a lot lately is what we do about reimbursable services, right? And the types of titles that can be reimbursed for versus others. Um, you know, Dr. Ng, tell us about the work that you lead to broaden our thinking uh, around traditional mental health practice, right? I think that's speaking to Patrick's point as well and how this can translate to 988. What can we do? And I think you know, this is expanding a conversation to important cross-sector collaboration, right? Who really needs to be a part of this so that we can take it there? So Dr. Ng, I'll come to you. Thanks, um, and, and thank you. I, I, I always love hearing Honorable Patrick Kennedy speak because I think it brings it to really where it needs to be. Um, and this, this discussion is really not only at a high level, but actually um, very close to home for everyone. So when one in five people in this country um, have a mental health or behavioral health condition. That's you, that's your family. Like, how are you accepting that they are treated differently or not getting the care that they deserve and need? And that when they suffer and you love them, you suffer too. So I think I want to bring this home to where it needs to be, which is really where it starts, um, because I think that that's where it is. We're a country suffering and accepting that when we don't have to. And I think that that's where everyone on this call and everyone who can listen to this broadcast can really understand that you have power too. You have power to change the way that we're really looking at this. Um, and I think that from a sort of a cross sector um, sort of uh, involvement, as I mentioned before with the Surgeon General's advisory, it's gonna take all of us. Um, but I think that there are some specific interventions that we can all contribute to. Um, and as a child and adolescent psychiatrist working within a physician-led team of mental health providers as well as our community partners, I think it's really important to know that there are effective evidence-based treatments that are available. Not all of them are culturally informed and are adapted to the communities that they're serving. So we really need to be mindful of that. But at the same time, we need to understand that there's tiered levels of care in terms of treatment. So not everyone, as we talked about at the beginning with equity, not everyone needs the same thing, but not one size fits all. So we just understand that different layers of intensity of treatment, whether or not it's inpatient, emergency department, outpatient care, community support, peer mentoring, um, as well as any other sort of faith-based, as well as community-centered involvement, um, is really important. We need the whole spectrum, but we also need to be able to see it from an equity lens. Um, and I think that this is a unique opportunity to do things very differently. Um, and and you had invited us to really share our personal perspectives. I think as, for myself as a first gen gay Asian American immigrant whose first language is not in English, I really appreciate the fact that there are many barriers to actually accessing any kind of treatment for many people. And I also appreciate the fact that during this pandemic, um, it's really had a devastating toll on all of us. And in terms of our mental health, behavioral health, substance use, trauma, um, as well as loss and bereavement, I think that those are just all huge buckets with regards to how we're all collectively suffering. And how can we come out of this in a better way that can create a more just system for everyone? And I think that as you asked the question about cross-sector collaboration and how it's going to really involve um, all of us in terms of child and adolescent psychiatry, and I'll focus on that one particular role. And I love the fact, Madhuri, that you're continuing your clinical work because I'm sure that you experienced the demand for it as a licensed clinical social worker and the therapist, um, but also understanding that um, we're taking child and adolescent psychiatry, trying to bring the 
treatment where the kids are at. So schools, primary care, community, as well as community partnership, as well as leveraging part of our ability to work collaboratively within teams to be more impactful. Um, even though there's 14 for 100,000 child and adolescent psychiatrists in the country, and we need probably four or five times as many, but we also be needing to work differently. We need to be collaborative and leverage our experience within teams so that not everyone um, sees the same professionals, but depending on what you need and when you need it, by different team members, I think that that's what we need to really focus on. Um, and also really strengthening our communities because I think that we've underinvested in kids and adolescents. We've also ignored and neglected mental health and behavioral health. And we haven't really sort of taken care of all of us, um, even within ourselves. And I think that it's really an opportunity for us to really leverage um, this 988 um, crisis continuum. When you think about calling 988, oh my goodness, you're in a crisis, you're either suicidal or you're having a mental health crisis. How do you want someone else to hear you on the other side? Oh my goodness, at your worst moment. And so we need to bring our best to the worst moment. We need to be able to be even better than we are usually because when someone's in crisis, they're not their best. So they're not gonna be able to communicate all their needs. So we need to be understanding of how do we interpret that. Law enforcement is in itself law enforcement. It's not there to be therapeutic. It's not there to be healing. We need to transform that as well. But I think we need to just transform how we respond to people in crisis. And that's in an equitable manner, in a humble and respectful way. Um, but also in a sensitive and as well as, um, I, I love Terry, your, your comment about the crisis is the first call. It's not the end of the journey of treatment. And we need to be really thinking about that whole continuum of care as we're really looking at this as well. So thank you. No, thank you. And thank you so much for your disclosure too. I think it's really important sometimes for us to remember why we do this. You know, I think it's not, we all didn't just wake up to decide to be in the healing space where we want to make our system better. We all have our personal calling for that and we're informed by it. Linda, I saw your hand go up, so I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah. I mean, I, so for me, one of the things that I also just want to just kind of ground in is that a crisis is self-defined. Right. So it may not be that I'm at a place of being homicidal or suicidal. It may just be that my cat ran away and it's overwhelming to me. Right. It's a, it's really about it being emotionally stressful. Right. And, and to a point of recognizing that through this 988 system, there's even the ability to text, to chat, right. To just have that emotional support that's needed to avoid the the kind of to or to be a prevention mechanism i think is also important to recognize in this system and can really truly help in terms of creating an equitable space right so it's not necessarily just access at the time of homicidal or suicidal kind of ideation or thoughts or plans it's it's equitable access to resources when you're not at that point, but you still need that support. And I think that's a huge piece that we miss, right? When we are talking about this full continuum is even utilizing this system as a way for prevention, right? Because it's about someone to talk to, someone if needed to come to you or if needed you to go to, right? And so recognizing even the equity in the ways in which people communicate, um, teenagers, for example, I have three, they are much more likely to text or chat than they are to pick up a phone, right? And so I think when we look at equity as it relates to 988, we also need to be considering all of the ways in which, right, we access even the system and how it can support these, these historically uh, marginalized communities, right, in ways to get access in a preventative manner as well. I think also what we need to tackle part of this is, you know, legislative priorities um, that create safety nets for folks. Right. And I want to highlight that there were a couple that came up in our research and our survey that were stated as 
helpful if thoughtfully executed in advancing equity. I've noticed in our chat too, one of them has come up. Um, so Sonia and Terry and Patrick, I'd like to you know hear from you in terms of how these things can actually make sense nationally as we have regional and local interpretation of 988, right? Um, so one was making geolocation an opt-in and consent function for the caller, right? So if a caller calls, they can decide whether or not they want to be geolocated depending on their crisis. And this is, of course, in reference to ensuring that we don't do any harm by geolocating someone or outing them as being a vulnerable group that may not be met with safe, um, needed care that is also culturally responsive. Another one was the expansion of telehealth licensing. Um, you know, we have uh, regional telehealth licensing compacts, the counseling compacts that have become really effective through COVID in meeting some of these resource deprived areas with at least having a prescriber that can send in a script for someone who may need it or provide a consult on the phone. There were a lot of really creative ideas, too, where people could see that that could be sort of a, a helpful tool um, for some of the on the ground areas uh, in our country that don't have access to those resources as much as others. Um, but as well to enlist certain types of programs to incentivize um, folks to work in these rural areas where, you know, we, they don't have the resources as much as others. So when I'm bringing those up, um, you know, to say that what can we do legislatively to ensure there is safety? You know, the safety net is thoughtful. The safety net is responsive. Um, Sonia, maybe you can tell us about some of the priorities SAMHSA is focusing on to address some of these important policy questions, and then we'll, we'll open it up to the group as well. Okay, I, I can respond both initially on the issue of geolocation. Um, we've just hosted a, a big public forum with the um, VA and FCC to explore exactly these very critical um, and sensitive issues. And we heard from consumers on that panel that the main privacy concerns um, that they had uh, and, and are struggling with. And so we're trying to kind of create some balance. And the telecom representatives who are coming to the table, they're also trying to read. Uh, develop constructive solutions. So um, we understand that we, we will be able to provide a lot better care if we know where people are, but we also want to be conscious of the concerns that consumers have around that. Um, I will say that probably for us, the biggest way to continue to support the system from a legislative perspective is to fund it. Um, we, we do have a broad authority for lifeline activities in the current statute, and that's why um, the president's current uh, budget request uh, is almost 700 million for 988 and the behavioral health crisis services. And we're really excited about that kind of investment in the system. It would really, really make a big difference and go a long way in really entrenching um, 988 uh, in, in the local centers. And our 23 budget, our SAMHSA 23 budget also proposes new language um, and a new set aside that would require states to spend at least 10% of the mental health block grant for evidence-based prevention and early intervention programs. The block grant is primarily focused on, um, on supporting uh, uh, people with serious mental illness, but by, by increasing the prevention piece of this, we can really get to the outcomes for you know, at-risk youth and, and adults who are at risk of developing serious mental illness. And this will provide funding that we can use to shore up the, the broader crisis system as well. And, um, and even uh, as we always prefer, uh, downstream uh, to prevention, education, screening, and early identification. So we would prefer that folks not end up in crisis, but uh, want to make sure that that system is strong. And we also are looking at um, some additional mental health uh, block grant money uh, that will serve as, as a crisis set aside. So. Uh, we are we are really excited about the president's commitment to the issue and the incredible um, investments that uh, he has proposed in the 23 budget. It's these are game changing investments in this system, and we hope they, keep, they stay there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll turn that to yeah. Terry. Totally, and you know, I think one thing is you know just so our audience understands the real importance of why this is needed. You know. Suicide is now the second leading cause of death in indigenous youth aged 10 to 24. Um, that is horrific. Uh, that is horrific. And I think we can all agree that that's just beyond belief terrible. We also know that the, the demand for mental health services during COVID-19 
increased exponentially and we we need to do something to be able to meet there so this is really just an important critical time and we're grateful for the commitment that's there federally to be able to make this happen um but you know terry you know if you could tell us a bit more to expand on the commitment to this and you know what you can hope that this will look like that would be great for our audience to hear sure and as sonia mentioned the fy23 budget really is a bold statement of the president's priorities and really how he is framing and prioritizing mental health. As part of his State of the Union address, he identified tackling the mental health crisis as a key part of his unity agenda. These are topics that bring us together, that unite us. This isn't you know, a, a red state or a blue state issue. We are all feeling the uh, challenges associated with mental health. And so we've outlined um, a really bold kind of strategy of ways in which we can ensure that we're transforming how we address mental health. And as I mentioned earlier, it's about building the system that will work for everyone. This is about bold investments in increasing the size and the diversity of the workforce, creating the system and the infrastructure that's necessary, not only to meet people at the time of crisis, such as the um, investments that Sonia mentioned that we are calling for in the budget uh, with respect to 988 and the crisis services continuum, but also making sure that we can transform our human and social safety net so that we are putting resources into systems where people are, more providers in schools, more um, informed and capable um, safety net responders so that we are making sure that we're supporting people before they face crises. And so as we're focused on building a better system, particularly around 988 and this opportunity, we're also looking at ways that we can connect more people to care. And so lowering some of those barriers that we've been talking about, addressing some of the discrimination and bias that has long faced um, populations that uh, have mental illness, but also have substance use uh, disorders. And so looking at ways in which we can expand access to care. And you mentioned telehealth. This is something that you talk about in your policy brief. And this is something that the president's called for as well. You know, we're leaning in in ways that we can encourage and do more to create a federal framework that will promote the use of interstate compacts and create more reciprocity across state lines so that we can expand access, particularly for underserved uh, populations, but also trying to lean in and work with our uh, colleagues in Congress to think beyond uh, what can be done through interstate compacts and, and really kind of call for expanding access to services via telehealth. If there's one um, kind of, you know, shining light that came out of the pandemic, it's the realization that mental health and substance use services can be delivered safely and effectively through telehealth. And so we want to make sure that those tools continue to be available for all those who need them while we're continuing to build the system and make it easier for people to access care in the healthcare setting through team-based approaches that we heard about, um, but also in non-medical settings where people may be more comfortable. We're doing a lot to kind of think about how we can address the needs of those who've been justice involved in particular, um, but even beyond kind of thinking about some of those vulnerable populations, it's really about these transformative investments that we have outlined in the budget and hoping that we can see some of those become real uh, in policy uh, through our uh, time to kind of watch folks in the Hill with Congress. Excellent. You know, it's inspiring me to ask, Linda, if you could just briefly touch on to you, you oversee several crisis collaboratives, you know, that you're working locally with providers, agency directors, things of that sort. What technical assistance do you think on the ground organizations would need to ensure that, you know, Terry and Sonia's priority points can be translated locally? I think it'd be helpful for us to hear, too, what kind of training you could imagine would be part of that. Um, yeah, so I think there's a a lot that can be done, right? I think the first thing is everyone has to speak the same language and be talking about the same thing. Um, and and it's important to realize that, you know, everyone defines, unfortunately, equity different or everyone, in, you know, defines cultural humility different. And so really making sure that we across the board have kind of set de definitions and understandings of what we're what we're moving towards and what the vision is, I think is huge, right? Um, and then I think really recognizing that it is a marathon and not a sprint, right? And that things are not just gonna change overnight. I think there's a lot of kind of level setting that needs to be done. You're right, right? In multiple states, we have community collaboratives where we really try to 
bring together all the stakeholders who potentially touch a person in crisis, right? That includes law enforcement, hospitals, community behavioral health providers, schools, community service providers, right? People who've actually experienced crisis themselves, faith-based communities, the community what I call cultural brokers, right? They all come together to talk about what the system needs to look like in their community. What are the modifications and cultural kind of, you know, modifications that have to be made in order to really serve their communities the way that they need to. And I think that's the piece that people need, the technical assistance and the facilitation, right? It's the convening and facilitation skills that oftentimes are needed to help get people all on the same page and moving towards the same goal so that you're not having, for lack of what, you know, a better way to say it, the telephone game. Well, they said this and they said this and this is what we think, right? And so I think that's a lot of the technical assistance that's needed is just the convening and facilitating of the discussions to get everyone on the same page and really allow each other to teach each other in a peer fashion what we need and what we need. Yes. And, you know, one of the things I think we highlighted, too, is the value of peer to peer learning opportunities. Right. Let some folks, you know, we do this in the international development space, actually, where we have, you know, different parts of the world come together to learn about best practices. I think it's a great opportunity for us to do us do that here. Um, you know, Patrick, I think as our founder, you know, your you use your voice in an immense way to also generate consensus with folks who may not be clinicians, may not be in the policy space, you know, and if you could tell us, you know, what they can do to ensure that the equity in 98 is a priority priority in their local community, I think that'd be really valuable. I provide some context, you know, I spoke to some local leaders um, down here in Georgia, you know, folks who are you know, working in precincts, working in dispatch, and a lot of them didn't know what 98 was, right? And so part of this is really important for us to, to not just speak at a high level, but Patrick, if you could tell our audience to what can they do locally to make sure that 988 is what they want it to be and that it is comprehensively meeting the needs of these you know, folks in need that really need to be addressed appropriately. Thanks, Father. Um, well, I'd first say we need to know the problem and we need to have it defined and we need to track the data. So now that I have Sonia and Terry on the line. I mean, we really need to make sure we're tracking outcomes and we're really thoughtful about what is most impactful in helping people build back their lives or get equity embedded in the response. There's got to be better ways that we can manage, as you know, you know, our suicide data, which that tragic number you recite at the beginning, moderate of suicide being the second leading cause of death of indigenous youth is just uh, outrageous. The fact, as Dr. Ng pointed out, we're in a childhood mental health crisis and insurance companies have record profits because the last couple of years, no one went to hospitals for surgery. And yet they still under resource this system. So I want consensus that that has to be rejected. I want consensus that, um, you know, Sonia doesn't have to worry about whether the budget's going to be approved on the Hill, because frankly, it's not enough to begin with. It's as much as Terry and the president could put forward. But let's be honest, we can't make up generations of underfunding this mental health system overnight. And if we don't have a pipeline of workers to provide for this needed infrastructure that is so underfunded, it, it, we're never going to address it. It's, it's, we need systemic change. We need accountability from the American Medical Association, who, with the relative value units, undervalues mental health clinicians. We need to look at all of the areas um, and we need to look at all the budgets so that we have adequate resources and housing so people with mental illness can recover and stay so that they're not falling through the cracks again and having to get another crisis because we have no system and continuity of care. So we need an agenda. At the end of the line, Madhuri, we need to empower the advocates that are on this uh, webinar and this watching this forum to understand that we need a way to track so that they can be sure that in Georgia, in Rhode Island, California, 
that we are doing what we can to fill in these gaps and so that they can hold their state policy officials accountable. They can hold their federal officials accountable. But the thing we've been missing is, as you point out, Madhuri, there's a lack of literacy in general. People aren't even aware that we're about to launch this 988 system. And, and these are the pieces that we need in place for it to be successful. Um, so there, there's just so much work to be done. But if we don't have a handle on what our priorities are and what exactly, as they say, you can't manage what you can't measure. If we don't know that it is underfunded in terms of supportive housing, if we don't know if the call-in center is underfunded, if we don't know if there is a inadequate social work, psychiatric social worker response or so forth and so on. We don't know if there's pre-adjudication. Uh, if we don't know there's enough uh, inpatient beds because IMD is still an embedded discriminatory practice within um, Medicaid that precludes people getting sufficient inpatient access to care. That's systemic discrimination. If we don't have these things mapped out, the advocates aren't gonna know how and where to push on those pain points that need to be fixed. I think that's a powerful place to be there. Sonia, did you want to, did you want to add something into that? Well, I just wanted to kind of uh, piggyback on that a teeny bit. Um, and just to this, uh, to the points about workforce and then particularly what we're trying to learn and listen, I really wanted to make it clear how important for us um, in all the work that we do, um, hearing from people with lived experience is essential. And we are working with the Action Alliance on research to better understand the help-seeking um, behaviors of communities that are at higher risk. We are doing tribal uh, engagements with tribal citizens and tribal nations to identify gaps and supports there. We are doing research related to the LGBTQ community. So um, while it may not be the kind of statistics that you're talking about, Patrick, we're certainly focused on how do we hear and listen to the communities that are being disproportionately impacted. And then we always, always have to make a plug for our online uh, jobs um, that we, we have a, a website because we are trying to help all our local centers staff up and particularly those that are serving those communities where we would really like to see uh, folks applying to do this work who um, look like and, and, and are connected to the communities that they would be serving locally. This work has to be done locally because that's how you connect people to that next, the next stage, which is what you were saying. It's not just the call, it's who comes to you and where do you go? And that has to happen on the local level in a culturally sensitive way. So um, please check out the jobs. Um, um, link on our website. We can we can send that around because we'd really like to get as many people applying to, to serve the system as, as possible. So, Son you. Sonia, I was on the Appropriations Committee in Congress. We absolutely knew we were underfunding Native American Indian Health Services. We had the lowest per capita ratio of crisis responders. This is not a mystery. We need to call this out put it in, in black and white right on the, these charts and show people that if you're not putting the money behind this, you're not honest about your desire to see all Americans treated equally. And um, so, and, and if we're not providing enough funding for those workforce that you just said you needed, right? Because all the other employees are getting boosts in their raises. And as I said, health insurers are giving bonuses to other health professions, but not mental health. And then they're blaming the psychiatrist for going out of network. I mean, that is inexcusable. And we have to push back in a children's mental health crisis for our health insurers, uh, you know, Beacon being the exception and others, like I said, like Andrew Dreyfus being the exception, we have to hold people accountable. It's, uh, and so, I, I thank Dr. Ng for going into this profession and for his leadership of the child and adolescent psychiatrist. We need to give him a pipeline for enough people to fill in those gaps. And unless we put the money in place, and that means you know, the, the, that in Oregon, the chairman of the finance committee had one of his psychiatric hospitals shut down three weeks ago because of inadequate staff. Now, and he's trying to get pay for 
to fund a pipeline for a future workforce that's not going to be there unless we are all the people on this call have eyes on the fact that there is no sufficient pay for in, in the to support the future mental health workforce we're t we're denying the reality we're we're deluding ourselves right now on this call if we're not honest about the fact we're never going to get out of this problem if we're not building the future workforce to meet the future need because on tragically as we know demand but our response is not going to be commensurate with the need I wish we had more time. I know there's so much more to say. And the thing that I love and hate about these panels is that they fly by. And before we know it, the hour is done. And I want to be so respectful of our esteemed guests who have joined us today to speak as well. Um, thank you so much for your candor, for your expertise, the passion you brought to today's discussion. I thank you for being champions of equity and leaders in this movement. I know this is only the beginning of our work together on advancing equity through 988. I also want to remind our audience members, we have a selection of very excellent, excellent um, keynote speakers coming up shortly, who are some leaders of lived experience as well, speaking more locally to congressionally and on the Senate side of what folks have been doing to our audience members who've been asking those questions. Um, but really to our panelists, your voice is truly making a difference uh, for us in the equity space. I couldn't do this work without your collaboration and your partnership. And the community you demonstrated today is what I believe is really necessary to get 988 right. So I thank you so much for your participation and for joining me. Um, we're going to take a break to queue up our keynote speakers. So please take this opportunity to our audience members to get up, stretch, take a quick bio break. We will be back shortly with our first speaker of the afternoon, Senator Catherine Cortez Masto of Nevada. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone, to the next segment in this Leadership Summit broadcast. For those who are newly joining us, my name is Madhuri Jai. I'm the director of the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity, and it is my pleasure to be your host for the afternoon. This afternoon's speakers are truly reflective of the diverse leadership needed to effectively embed equity into 988. I am thrilled at the opportunity for us all to listen to the power of their influence. Our first speaker, who is kicking off our our afternoon's lineup is no stranger to mental health advocacy and her work as a Senate leader. Senator Catherine Cortez Masto of Nevada has worked tirelessly in her role to expand access to quality mental and behavioral health care. She has successfully led the passing of bipartisan legislation that prioritizes and expands access to peer support for people in need. She has been leading the discussion on expansion of crisis services and has been a critical voice in making 98 possible. She has a particular interest in meeting the mental health needs of students and children, and Senator Cortez Masto has called on the Biden administration to work with her on launching a coordinated effort to improve school-based response. Thank you, Senator Catherine Cortez Masto, for joining us today. Hello, everyone. I'm U.S. Senator Catherine Cortez Masto of Nevada, and I am so glad to join you ahead of this important conversation. And I wanna thank Professor Ja and everyone at Morehouse School of Medicine for hosting this roundtable and for working to improve access to care. As a lifelong Nevadan, I've seen firsthand the challenges that communities of color face in accessing quality care across my diverse state. I know how important those mental and behavioral health services are. The pandemic only intensified mental health challenges for so many people across the country. That's why I made sure that the American Rescue Plan made an enormous investment in mental health services. And I'm glad to note that the administration has proposed even more in its recent budget. But we've still got work to do to make sure we're meeting the needs of diverse patient populations. I am proud to join my colleagues, Senator Menendez and Senator Booker, in leading legislation to bridge the gap in mental health disparities by providing more culturally appropriate materials for healthcare professionals. My hope is that easily accessible, targeted mental health care will also help break down the stigma around seeking help. I've also introduced bipartisan legislation to build a continuum of care of crisis services and make sure they're available in every community across the country. My bill would create a framework for crisis call centers, more robust mobile crisis units, and crisis stabilization facilities. These services will be a game changer for patients who aren't getting the care they need right now. Instead, they can encounter EMTs or law enforcement who aren't trained to help or spend days in the ER waiting for the right kind of care. It's especially important that we get this right for the millions of people who will be relying on 988 when it launches this summer. I will keep working to make sure that anyone in crisis can text or call to receive targeted and robust mental health care, no matter what language they speak or what culture they're from. I am glad for the work experts like you are doing to advance access to care. And I want you to know that you have a partner in me. Thank you. Our next speaker is a familiar and influential voice as a leader in behavioral health. The National Alliance for Mental Illness was founded by a group of mothers who weren't able to find the resources they needed to support their children struggling with mental illness. That's why, at their core, they are passionate about providing resources to people where there are gaps in our systems of care so that all people can have access to mental health support they deserve. NAMI partners with local affiliates and programs to meet people where they are, creating programs like FaithNet for religious leaders who often act as un untraditional first responders in communities of color, and Compartiendo Esperanza for Spanish speakers who often struggle to find resources in their own language. 988 is a huge step in making life-saving resources available to people in crisis, but it will take intentional effort and investment to ensure that this critical resource is truly available to every community. Leading the charge at NAMI is its president and CEO, Dan Gilson, someone who I personally have had the privilege of being in community with and I know is committed to advocating for a crisis response system that ensures anyone who dials 988 regardless of their background, we'll have someone to talk to, someone to respond and somewhere to go. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today and gracing us with the privilege of hearing your profound expertise. Thank you very much on behalf of NAMI and all of our uh, field leaders uh, and our staff. 
uh, and all of our volunteers. We appreciate uh, what you're doing and uh, congratulations to the Center for Mental Health Equity, the Kennedy uh, Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity and uh, Beacon Health Options for actually taking this on um, and uh, uh, really uh, enjoyed uh, going over the policy brief and uh, the recommendations that you have in the policy brief. Uh, we're in the communities across the country. So we see this every day from the standpoint of responses uh, and what those responses should look like and the need uh, for uh, equity in those responses. Uh, we live it, we breathe it, we're in the communities uh, and we're where the rubber hits the road in terms of providing the support. So uh, nothing about us without us. So this conversation about equity with 988 is critically important and it will take partnerships like this to make it happen. Okay, we're going to take a quick break um, to set up our next speaker um, and we will be back with you shortly. Thank you for your flexibility in our tech technology uh, journeys that we're always on in these uh, virtual spaces, Dan, I much appreciate it. Um, but it's a pleasure to be able to do a, a quick discussion with you on some priorities we think are necessary. So, you know, I think um, you had an opportunity to look at the way that we tackled embedding equity into 988 and tell us specifically, you know, in your perspective, um, what do you think is important to ensure safety nets are in place? for the specific groups we highlighted, you know, that were most vulnerable in our current psychiatric structure. So of course that includes BIPOC communities, LGBTQIA plus communities, immigrant, refugee, non-English speaking groups. Um, you know, in your perspective, what can we do on the ground to ensure those needs are met? And I think it'd be great to also hear our audience um, learn more about sort of the local work that NAMI does because the affiliates are a huge part of this and the advocacy at the local level is, a, is an important role that you all play. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you for the work that you're doing at, at the at the leadership helm uh, there, and as well as the work you continue to do a couple of nights a week in terms of your continued work in the in the mental health field and actually seeing patients. You know, th this is a. Uh, this is noble work. It's hard work, and we appreciate what you're doing. Uh, in terms of answering the question, let me first go back to to the technology. Uh, we 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 we've we've had to navigate this technology, and we're doing it pretty well. Uh, I didn't want to come and make a speech, but I do want to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing. And um, I want to start off by just talking about you know this really is going to take. Well, first of all, nine eight eight once in a lifetime opportunity for us to to, to actually reimagine crisis response and to a imagine a new normal for crisis response and to do that this is a very important convening and convenings like this will continue to, to be important that's why we've done reimagine crisis response uh, week of action at nami and uh, had about 41 partners participate in it because we know it's going to take all of us and um to the point of um uh, senator masto uh, cortez masto speaking earlier and uh, representative cardenas um, their work is critically important in terms of leadership, tone, and execution, uh, because this is all about tone and then execution. Um, and we have to execute and get this right. We're 25 days out from the launch of 988. So we need to talk about what it's going to be and what are the possibilities for what it's going to be. In terms of what we do in the communities, uh, we're where the rubber hits the road in terms of uh, the uh, support groups that we provide in the communities for individuals living with uh, with mental illness and, and their loved ones. So if you're looking for peer to peer, if you're looking for family to family, connecting those dots so people see someone who looks like them, who, who is experiencing life like them and say, um, this, this, this is evidence-based work that we can share in, in terms of our, our programming that we do at the, at the local level. We also connect people uh, by way of them trying to navigate the quote unquote system in terms of how do they get care. So we do that at the local level. Um, in terms of the, the, the work going forward and, and what you've put in your recommendations, um, I, I think the first couple, uh, uplift groups who are historically invisible. Uh, our communities, we, historically invisible, um, uh, uh, underrepresented, uh, and, and, and many times transparent. Uh, so the next one is, uh, the second one that you, you put in there, is the, it's, it's for us as well, is law enforcement um, participation then those mental health crisis response uh, should be as needed. It should not be the first, but as needed if a community has not built out a mobile crisis uh, response system. Only if a community has not built out that mobile crisis response system should law enforcement be the, be the um, uh, responder. Law enforcement doesn't want to be, and 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 we don't want law enforcement to, to have to, to to take that on. Uh, we would prefer the communities to have mobile crisis uh, response systems built in with with a a a, uh, a, a team that can respond. That uh, uh, like in my community, um, uh, I live in a community where we have about uh, I, um, um, a county uh, police substation. They have about forty cars. For every five cars, I'd love to see a mobile crisis unit that's uh, outfitted differently, looks differently, and also has a triage team of a behavioral health expert uh, and, and some other type of responders other than law enforcement that actually go out together to respond. Uh, and they can help with a person that is uh, de-escalating and, 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 oh, excuse me, that is decompensating. And they, if they can't de-escalate, they can take them to a crisis intervention system uh, 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 services uh, location. Um, we believe that there is, you know, uh, in our community, it's, it's help, not handcuffs. And what we've seen going upstream is we've seen that our jails have become the ipso facto mental health hospitals in the United States. And, that, and, and what we see is that if you have someone that's in a mental health crisis and they get a law enforcement response, many times it's hard to turn that back into a getting them into the mental health system because they're now in the law enforcement system. They're in the justice system, if you will. So from the justice system back into the system that, that they really needed care, help, not handcuffs, is where we need to see that go. I absolutely agree. And I think it's ensuring that our system doesn't traumatize people more. I'm curious to know, you know, one of the things that was brought up in our panel was ensuring that people feel comfortable calling 988, especially in communities of color where calling 911 has been met with 
fear as opposed to help seeking. Um, what do you think we can do to ensure that that bridge is made, right? That communities um, like the BIPOC communities we serve feel comfortable calling 988 and know that 988 will be the culturally responsive response that they need. You know, that, that, that question is giving me chills. It's giving me chills as, a, as, as representing NAMI, but it's giving me chills as a father, as an uncle. I don't have a number to call right now. Uh, and that's not emotional, that's fact-based. If, if, if the whole point of me making that call is because I have someone in crisis and I love them and I want, I, I want to look out for their safety and their well-being, why would I call 911 knowing what the, the, the statistics show? in terms of uh, I'm really taking a risk by making that call and I'm taking a calculated risk based off of if, if I am, you know, um, looking at the, the numbers, if I'm looking at the stats, I'm putting my loved one more at risk in, 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 in making that call because I am one of the things that we don't have in the BIPOC community in terms of this discussion is trust, trust of the system. And that trust is 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 the lack of trust is there. Uh, not based off of fiction, but based off of facts. So I would ask, uh, answering your question, I would answer it with a question. Why could, why should I feel in, enabled to make that call to 911 for a loved one that's in a mental health crisis if I'm looking at the statistics of what has occurred for other families that look like mine that have made that call? And the outcome has been tragic when what they were looking for was help. So this, very, this, always, this this discussion is so critically important. And I do not have a number that I can call. And uh, I think it's going to be some time uh, in, in development, but it's an exciting time to see uh, if we can get there. If you could just maybe in, in, you know, in the time we have left together, tell us maybe at the community level with your affiliates, some of the some of the things you're doing to educate folks on 988, you know, how are you getting the word out? How are you recognizing that tr that mistrust is there, but then also saying, hey, we have this number for you now that looks really different in, in terms of the response. You know, what what can we what can we be doing and what can our audience hear from you? Yeah, our advocacy team has just done a wonderful job on behalf of NAMI and our community. You know, one of the things that I, uh, I, I heard uh, um, uh, Dr. Linda Henderson Smith uh, speak of a little earlier was convenings um, and uh, technical assistance. And to that point, what we're doing is we are a convener and what we've done is we've created something called Reimagine Crisis Response. And in that, uh, through our advocacy team, we've done a week of action. And then on the, the um, last week, I think 30 days out, uh, we did another um, um, one day event in terms of reimagining crisis response and saying that uh, we, we're messaging it out to all of the communities. Uh, we're targeting all of our 660 plus affiliates and state organizations uh, to educate them. And we've also created a advocacy toolkit and we have advocacy sessions uh, where we actually are teaching our and, and we're offering um, um, the toolkit and learnings uh, on how to advocate uh, with your 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 uh, legislature and, uh, and 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 your state uh, elected officials in terms of uh, what to ask, um, how to position it, what is the status of it? We have a heat map that shows what states are where. So we're doing a great deal of exposure in terms of uh, crisis response in nine eight eight. So that's what we're doing uh, at the local level. Fabulous. You know, we're going to share the toolkit as well in the chat, if it's okay with you for our audience to have a reference to that, because I think that's a fantastic resource people can start to use. Um, you know, I want to know from you the last question, Dan, if we get 988 right, what does that mean for mental health care? What will happen if we get oh 988 gosh. right? If, you know, um, if we get it right, our jails will look different. Our communities will feel different. The level of trust will go up and we will see a system that truly is equitable if we get it right. That's what we right. will get. Right. You know, I always say 9 and 8 is about saving lives. You know, I've done so many interviews lately and it's like if we execute 911 like 9 and 8 like we've executed 911 people will continue to die. And our opportunity here is to give people an access to thriving that there's a life beyond crisis. Um, and I really thank you for your leadership and for being such a candid 
model of what needs to be said. You know, I think sometimes we skirt around the importance of saying that mistrust is real in the communities we serve, but your representation of honesty is what we actually need at the helm of making sure that 988 is equitable. Thank you so much for the time you gave us today, Dan. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for what you're doing. One of our greatest priorities here at the Kennedy Satcher Center is that leadership is inclusive of leaders of lived experience. And our platform gives visibility to groups that are historically left out of the conversation when it comes to change. According to Harvard Medical School, the word neurodiversity refers to the diversity of all people, but it is often used in the context of autism spectrum disorder, as well as other neurological or developmental conditions such as ADHD or learning disabilities. The neurodiversity movement emerged during the 1990s, aiming to increase acceptance and inclusion of all people while embracing neurological differences. While it is primarily a social justice movement, neurodiversity research and education is increasingly important in how clinicians view and address certain disabilities and neurological conditions. When it comes to emergency response, our system has grossly neglected the needs of people living with conditions like autism. Lisa Morgan is an important voice for us to listen to when thinking about embedding equity into 988. She is a leader living with autism, is a suicide loss survivor, and a board certified autism specialist. She is a leading national consultant and advisor, leveraging the visibility of neurodiverse individuals as a researcher, a trainer, and a highly sought after speaker. It is my distinct honor to have her join us today as a keynote. Lisa, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here today to talk about how and why crisis support systems currently in place have historically failed autistic and other neurodiverse people. And more importantly, what we can do differently as 988 launches in July. Neurodiversity refers to a difference in the way people relate to and experience the world. And while neurodiversity does include diversity of all people, it is most often used when referring to autism, as well as other neurodevelopmental conditions such as ADHD and learning disabilities. The term neurodiversity was originally coined to promote equality and inclusion among neurological minorities. I'll use the terms autism and neurodiverse people interchangeably today as I talk. Autism is a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition with challenges in social communication, learning, and restricted repetitive behaviors. Autism is a spectrum condition. Due to the wide range of strengths, abilities, and challenges each autistic person faces. And even within any one autistic person, depending on what they are experiencing throughout their day. Many autistic people prefer identity first language, for example, autistic person, instead of person first language, for example, person with autism because they culturally identify as autistic. Still, it's more supportive to ask a person about a person's preferred language and how they'd like to be addressed. Suicide is a leading cause of premature death for autistic people. According to Cassidy et al, 2014, up to seven, up to, I'm sorry, up to half of all autistic people will attempt suicide in their lifetime. Autistic people face up to a seven fold higher risk of premature death by suicide compared to the general population. Yet when autistic people reach out for help, most have shared being unintentionally harmed by the well-meaning professionals who are there to assist them. By unintentional harm, I mean autistic people find themselves experiencing more trauma, confusion, and misunderstandings when reaching out for help. Many autistic people already feel they do not belong to our society. And that feeling is reinforced when they come out to understand through lived experience, help and support are out of reach and ultimately harmful. There is a critical lack of knowledge and understanding of autism by professionals around crisis supports and suicide prevention. 
For example, autistic people can present differently than non-autistic people in crisis. They can present as calm. They can lose their ability to speak or have difficulty expressing and identifying their emotions. Autistic people may communicate in a different way than verbally speaking. And any of these differences in communication can result in a suicidal autistic person being dismissed as fine. To make matters even more complicated, some of the warning signs of suicide for the general public describe behaviors very similar to living with autism, such as withdrawing, which autistic people do for self-care and to stay regulated. Sleep issues and anxiety, as well as verbalizing feeling trapped because there's little freedom in just being autistic in today's society. As well, some behaviors of autism can be mistaken for warning signs of suicide, autistic meltdowns, stimming, and ruminating can all look like risky behaviors or sudden mood changes. Either can result in unintentional harm if an autistic person is thought to be suicidal when they're just being autistic or thought to be just autistic when they're actually suicidal. There are unique risk factors of suicide for autistic people that must be known and understood by professionals supporting them. The typical risk factors for the general public still pertain to autistic people, along with the unique risk factors determined through research studies, such as masking, which is a safety strategy to fit in and is done by completely suppressing all autistic traits and squelching any overwhelming sensory stimulation in the environment to ultimately act like everyone else around them. There is also autism burnout, a complete exhaustion caused by the demands of life chronically exceeding an autistic person's ability to cope, which can result in suicidal thoughts and behaviors. There's countless negative social interactions throughout the lifespan, resulting in thwarted belonging. Also, receiving a late diagnosis, being female, the number of unmet support needs are all unique risk factors of suicide for autistic people. Consider how unique risk factors, a sevenfold higher risk of dying by suicide than the general public, broad miscommunication about autism, uncommon presentations in crisis, different modes of communication, and a history of unintentional harm can leave an autistic person needing support, but are unable to obtain it in a way that is safe and helpful. I, as an autistic person, experienced unintentional harm when on June 21st, 2015, seven years ago today, my husband died by suicide. His body was found on June 24th, 2015, around 6 p.m. The trauma I experienced that night was not only from the realization my husband killed himself, but also from the well-meaning professionals who were there to support me and help me. The unintentional harm I experienced started off by the policeman directing me where to stand so I would be safe while they went inside the house to do a wellness check on my husband, which resulted in, due to my acute sense of smell, me realizing standing there alone in front of my garage doors that my husband was dead just a few feet away from me and had been for several days. The minute or two I stood outside by myself trying to grasp the realization that my life had just abruptly changed and I was a widow seemed interminable. The unintentional harm continued when the policeman rushed back outside of the house and abruptly surrounded me again to keep me safe from going back into the house, yet again, not understanding they moved too fast, crowded me too close, and I collapsed to the ground overwhelmed by them. And then suddenly a heavy hand landed on my shoulder. I didn't expect it, I didn't know what it meant, and it scared me. I felt that pressure on my shoulder for months afterwards when I, whenever I thought about that night. 
Then I found myself trying to answer all kinds of questions with high anxiety, a slow processing speed, and believing the inability to make eye contact would somehow get me into trouble. I was kept from regulating myself because they didn't understand what I needed. For example, I was given all kinds of important information that I could not possibly remember. I was repeatedly encouraged to interact with the therapy dog I could not relate to. I was asked over and over again to sit in a car to get out of the heat, humidity, and mosquitoes, which all were a sensory nightmare, when what I needed more was to pace and try to regulate my high anxiety. And finally, I was not allowed to see my husband's body come out of the garage and be put into the coroner's van after I explained I needed that visual to begin to comprehend what he had done to himself. When everyone finally left, I felt completely, utterly, profoundly alone and misunderstood. The support, the support I was given caused me to work much harder to just be okay. I believe all the actions of the first responders and the victim advocate there that night were kind, helpful, and supportive to non-autistic people. I was traumatized, confused, and unintentionally harmed because they did not understand how I experience and relate to people in the environment. I experienced trauma through my senses and through miscommunication. I now understand the firm hand on my shoulder was meant to be supportive and encouraging, but I did not understand that in the moment. What I needed was to know what was going to happen. For example, being told, I'm going to put my hand on your shoulder to lead you across the street to talk to the police sergeant would have alleviated the angst I felt for months when reliving that hand on my shoulder. If you feel that that's a minor issue, you do not understand autism. And those feelings are what stands in the way of autistic people being truly helped and not harmed. First responders and the wider community of professionals, crisis center workers, victim advocates, and mental health providers need education and training to help them better understand autism, including what it's like to live life as an autistic person. Out of the recommendations put forth by the 988 policy brief, the fifth one, targeted comprehensive training for key personnel prioritizing and enhancing specific skills that contribute to more equitable outcomes, I believe is the most important for autistic and or neurodiverse people. And the trainings need to be more than one hour workshops with the ultimate goal being to understand and embrace the culture of autistic and other neurodiverse people. The trainings must include lived experience, communicating with autistic people in crisis, safety plans developed specifically for autistic brains, resources developed specifically for autistic people, and the latest research findings on unique risk factors and warning signs. Trainings can lead to effective communication strategies and build efficacy in working with autistic people. But the trainings must be developed by or in collaboration with actually autistic people. We know autism. We are autistic. We know more about the reality of living with autism in today's society than people who have worked with autistic people for any number of years. No amount of education, work experience, knowledge about autism, or even research findings can measure up to or compare to lived experience. Autistic people can share their own knowledge of appropriate interventions and supports, how autistic people present in crisis, how they communicate, as well as ways to regulate and process information while in a crisis. It must be recognized that autistic people or neurodiverse people in general experience the world differently. One single approach won't work. Having access to essential personnel such as mental health professionals and peer recovery specialists will not alleviate unintentional harm unless they have specific training to understand the culture of autistic and other neurodiverse people. When 988 launches in July, 
as this nation's first national emergency line devoted to psychiatric response and preparedness, we have an extraordinary opportunity to provide safe, helpful crisis supports for autistic and other neurodiverse people. We have a chance to show autistic people they're not alone when in a crisis. We have the opportunity to undo the expectation of unintentional harm and replace it with trust and hope. The 988 emergency line can change the status quo and embrace neurodiversity in such a way that autistic people can feel safe in reaching out for help. Thank you. That I have really no words for how educational and informative and honest that was. Um, I really thank you for being so candid with us at, about your experience. Today is a day that could have been very difficult for you, and you chose to use your platform to inform our audience about something so important and ensuring that um, people with lived experience of autism and other neurodiverse experiences are visible in 988. Um, I really thank you for your time. This has been amazing to hear from you. And I hope this is just the first of many opportunities we can work together. I hope so too. And I very much appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Congressman Tony Cardenas of California. Congressman Cardenas led the introduction of the Bipartisan 988 Implementation Act. The transformative comprehensive legislation will provide federal funding and guidance for states to implement their crisis response infrastructure ahead of the July launch, increasing locally tailored and regionally appropriate resources for states to effectively implement 988. Congressman has championed health equity in all that he does, advocating for expansion of parity, culturally responsive mental health and addiction treatment, and has led the introduction of several bills focused on advancing equity for BIPOC communities that have been historically neglected by our mental health care system. Congressman Cardenas, we are so grateful for your work and for taking the time to speak to us today about its importance. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Congressman Tony Cardenas, and I'm proud to serve California's 29th Congressional District, as well as sit on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. Before I begin, I want to give a special thanks to the Kenny Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity and the Morehouse School of Medicine for their work on this important and timely topic and for inviting me to speak today. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about Crisis Response, the launch of the 988 Helpline and what it actually looks like to implement these life-saving services in an equitable manner. To understand where we eventually want to be with mental health crisis services, it would serve us well to look back on the history of a much more familiar emergency infrastructure. When someone has a medical emergency and they call 911, we expect a prompt and professional response from experts with appropriate medical training. But this wasn't always the case. Prior to the 1970s, in most parts of the country, if you had a stroke or a heart attack, you called the police, who would come to the scene, put you in the back of their patrol car, and drop you off at the door of the nearest hospital. Today, that seems bizarre. And it's because of the advocacy then culminating in the Emergency Systems Response Act passed by Congress in 1973 that we have the ambulances, the EMTs, the paramedics, and emergency rooms that we are so familiar with today. However, for mental health and substance use emergencies, we're still where we were 50 years ago. We're accustomed to seeing police respond to calls about mental health emergencies we're also accustomed to seeing jails and emergency rooms as the default treatment facilities. It's the status quo. And the reality is that it is just not working. Time and again, we've seen the devastating consequences of what happens when police officers respond to mental health emergencies. The fact is that Americans with untreated mental illness are 16 times more likely to be killed by law enforcement. Not only is this tragic, it's preventable. We can and must stop criminalizing mental illness and get people in crisis the help they need. Setting that stage, I want to shift now to a much more recent law passed by Congress, the National Suicide Hotline Designation Act of 2020. 
This legislation spearheaded by my congressman friend Seth Moulton and advocates who were appalled by the inadequate response for mental health and substance use crisis designated 988 as a new national hotline which gives in just a few short weeks all of us an opportunity to call 988 and get the response we deserve. It takes the already existing National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and expands the focus past just suicide prevention to any type of mental health related crisis, including those from substance use disorders. People can also dial 988 if they are worried about a loved one who may need crisis support. Having a more accessible call line will be key in the effort to address mental health crises. But just like 911, 988 can't only be a number someone calls, there must also be someone to come and somewhere to go if you need it. Crisis care is a continuum, just like it is for other medical emergencies. When you call 911 for a medical emergency, it's not just a hotline, they also send a team of medical professionals to you. And this team might be able to solve the issue on the scene, and if not, they can get you to a place to get more comprehensive care, such as an emergency room. Just as paramedics and EMTs are trained to specially respond to medical emergencies, wherever that emergency may be, callers in crisis who reach out to 988 for help should be able to depend on crisis professionals who are especially trained to respond to mental health crises. So that is the promise of 988, connecting people who reach out for help to care that's specific to their needs and based in their community. It's an amazing opportunity to revolutionize the way we respond to mental health emergencies. It is something I hope we can rely on everywhere, just as we rely on emergency medical services. But I would be remiss if I did not mention the challenges. Right now, implementation is a huge undertaking, especially making sure it's done equitably. Not only does this require significant funds to build out, but it also will take personnel, infrastructure, coordination of services, and perhaps most importantly, an understanding of the diverse circumstances of people across the country. While we face a long road ahead, this fight is worth it. It shouldn't matter what neighborhood, city, or state you live in, what insurance you have or don't have, or what language you speak. 988 and crisis services need to be available to everyone. But right now that isn't the case. And there are major concerns about how reliable and accessible 988 and crisis services will be across the country. A big part of this is funding and another part is leadership. We need federal funding to support 988 implementation so that everyone has reliable services. After all, 988 is a federal initiative. To secure the funds necessary for 988 to be successful, we need leadership. We need members of Congress to be responsive to the needs in their states and to make sure that this is a priority. You can consider me all in on these efforts. Supporting 988 is one of my biggest priorities this Congress, and not only am I working to get as much of my bill, the 988 Implementation Act, to the President's desk, I am also leading a task force to address the needs of 988 and crisis services implementation well into the future. My 988 Implementation Act includes a number of important provisions to support equitable access. It includes provisions to train a diverse workforce, including peers and crisis workers with lived experience. It has funding for accessibility for those who may not be served well by a traditional telephone line, including individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing, or who speak another language. It funds mobile crisis response as alternative to police. It also has a sustainable funding to incentivize every state to invest in the full continuum of crisis care. I'm proud to say that we work with organizations in all 50 states as well as a number of territories and tribal leadership to ensure that everyone's voice was included. Our legislation has also been endorsed by more than 110 organizations. We currently have more than 40 members of Congress supporting this bill and hope that with continued education and advocacy, more will join. But it will take more than leadership at the federal level to ensure the success of 988. We also need leadership at the state level 
to take hold of these implementation challenges and to coordinate with SAMHSA and the relevant federal agencies as 98 rolls out. Only a small handful of states have instituted state-level policy that would create a funding stream for crisis services. Without these types of policies, the mental health care continuum will not be able to keep up with the high volume of demand. So that is my request to all of you. As leaders in your organizations and communities, please continue to pay attention to the implementation of 988 and crisis services, not just in July, but in the many months to follow. This is a once in a generation moment, which has the potential to shift the narrative of how we respond to mental health in this country. Please use your voice and tell others about how important it is for people in your community to have access to 988 and crisis services regardless of their background. My hope is that if we do this together, that anyone in crisis will feel safe reaching out for help. And when they do, they'll have someone to call, someone to come, and somewhere to go. Thank you again, and have a great rest of your afternoon. As he stated, it's really important that we all take in that local leadership is just as important as national leadership. And I hope all of our audience is hearing that, that on the ground, it's important that your local leaders understand what your needs are and can do something to do at the level that Congressman Cardenas is doing at his. As we continue the priority to advance visibility for the most invisible, we recognize that the experience of indigenous people in the United States continues to be underrepresented in our data in our resource allocation and our systemic response to healthcare overall. Indigenous communities are experiencing some of the highest rates of addiction, suicide, incarceration, and crisis than any other community in the US. A study conducted by HHS found that 82% of the surveyed facilities that reach American Indian Alaska Native communities reported that although they on paper provide mental health services, a variety of staffing issues and shortages affected access to these critical services. Most notable was the extreme shortage of observed psychiatrists and other licensed providers at the Indian Health Service and tribal facilities overall. Suicide, as we've stated throughout this uh, convening today, is now the second leading cause of death in indigenous youth aged 10 to 24. This is a true crisis and it is imperative that tribal clinic sites are equipped with funding and resources from 988 to ensure that needs can be met. Our culminating keynote has been a leader in the suicide prevention field for the past 15 years. Shelby Rowe, a member of the Chickasaw Nation, speaks openly about her own lived experience and has sought advanced training to understand how to effectively work at the local, state, tribal, and national level to advance access to equitable, equitable mental health care for indigenous communities and communities as a whole. She is the newly appointed director of the Suicide Prevention Resource Center and the recipient of the 2021 American Association of Suicidology Transforming Lived Experience Award. She is also the 2016 Chickasaw Nation Dynamic Woman of the Year. Shelby, thank you for being our powerful culminating keynote speaker. We are so grateful for the opportunity to learn from you. Yeah, Koke, okay. thank you. Um, Chokma, Soho Chopo at Shelby. Hello, uh, my name is Shelby Chikasha Saya. Um, I am Chickasaw. Um, I am very proud um, to be an Indigenous woman. And although my professional title, you know, is I am the director of the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, today I'm speaking to you more as an urban Indigenous woman uh, with personal experience with suicide. And because I cannot possibly represent all tribal voices and communities, um, I have a small little video to bring more voices to this conversation because our needs are diverse, our people are diverse. And so if someone can upload my video, we can do that and then I'll get started with my comments. Dakota means friend, friendly. The people who gave that name to the Dakotas have sadly never been treated as friends. The people whose language was used to name the Dakotas and Minnesota and Iowa, Oklahoma, Ohio, 
Connecticut, Massachusetts, and other states, the Native American tribes, the people who were here before us, long before us, have never been treated as friends. They have been treated as enemies and dealt with, with more harshly than any other enemy in any of this country's wars. The original sin of this country is that we invaders shot and murdered our way across the land, killing every Native American we could and making treaties with the rest. This country was founded on genocide before the word genocide was invented, before there was a war crimes tribunal in The Hague. When we finally stopped actively killing Native Americans for the crime of living here before us, we then proceeded to violate every treaty we made with the tribes, every single treaty. We piled crime on top of crime on top of crime against the people whose offense against us was simply that they lived where we wanted to live. We don't feel the guilt of those crimes because we pretend they happened a very long time ago in ancient history and we actively suppress the memories of those crimes. But there are people alive today whose grandparents were in the business of killing Native Americans. That's how recent these crimes are. That we still have Native Americans left in this country to be arrested for trespassing on their own land is testament not to the mercy of the genocidal invaders who seized and occupied their land, but to the stunning strength and the 500 years of endurance and the undying dignity of the people who were here long before us, the people who have always known what is truly, what sacred, is truly sacred in this world. In this world. I hope just in watching that, that maybe we challenge some of your stereotypes of what it means to be a Native American in 2022. Um, when we're making policies with my job, I have the privilege of sitting in the room where policy decisions are being made. And oftentimes we are only making space for indigenous people who live on tribal reservations, um, whereas up to 80% of us don't live on reservations and 70% live in urban areas. Um, so we are everywhere. And so when we're talking about serving tribal populations, when I talk about that right now, I'm talking about all of our populations, our tribal citizens and our tribal nations. Um, as 988 is getting developed, it is inspiring to hear that this is a system designed for all that it is a system, the goal is that all Americans experiencing crisis will have someone to talk to, someone to respond, and somewhere to go. This system will not be equitable unless we make it equitable, unless we take deliberate steps to make it an equitable system. And I think that we can. Um, in the president's budget, uh, mental health crisis response is funded at levels we have never seen before. Um, but again, if we do not insist that that be built into a more equitable system, we could end up with very uh, well-funded, inequitable um, 988 responses. And so, you know, with that, you know, I call on um, the president of the White House. I call on SAMHSA and my other national partners. You know, what are those milestones? What does an equitable system look like? And let's hold the states accountable. Um, as someone who in my career has managed many federal grants, if it is a grant requirement, we make it happen. So as more funds are available, um, I'm looking forward to reading the bill um, of the legislator who spoke just before me from California. What is that accountability for equitable? Um, because, you know, in the business world, the difference between a dream and a goal is do you have a budget and a work plan? 
what is the budget? Where can you show us in this budget what is going towards equity? Can you show us in the budget what are the measurable goals? What is the timeline? <clears throat> I am saying this because I know that my friends at Vibrant are working on this. Vibrant is tasked with being the administrator of the network. And I know that as they have received more funds, they are working on this. They are investing in equity. Um, they are making this a priority. Um, but I would say that we cannot rely on all of the states and territories to make it a priority because it's the right thing to do. It needs to be a priority because that is what is demanded, what is expected by the public and by their funder, the federal government. Um, for example, with the 988 funding that is coming to the states, um, they are asked to partner with their tribes. Um, I would ask the federal government to hold those states accountable. Um, these tribal nations have treaties with the U.S. government. And for some of the tribes, such as mine, the Chickasaw Nation, in exchange for Mississippi, Alabama, the southern part of Tennessee, the federal government promised to take care of our health care needs. So it is not a charitable benefit. Um, it is rent. Um, we... We kept our end of the treaty and we asked the federal government to continue to keep their end of the treaty. And when we see funding health care, this is a federal treaty obligation between two governments. Um, so to pass that on to the states, because the states do not have a government to government relationship with the tribes within their boundaries. Um, so for those tribal citizens who are dual citizens in that state and in our nation, uh, we need to make sure that we're building systems that provide the same level of care um, for those tribal citizens in their boundaries as for any other citizen. It's also important as we build out this system that we loop in those tribal behavioral health care providers. You know, as was mentioned, there are many issues and shortcomings, just as in states and in rural populations, mental health care, first responders has been woefully underfunded um, for years. So tribal populations are not unique in this. But in certain tribal communities, um, they have very robust resources available for mental health treatment, for substance use disorder treatment, to help build paths to recovery um, for those within their service. So if our state 988 systems are not linking in with the tribes, um, these are resources available that are going to go unused by those tribal citizens that could benefit greatly by being served by their communities. And so that happens best at the local level. That is something for the states and territories to look at and to know what are those resources so that we are pointing individuals towards the care they need um, with a focus on cultural humility. You know, I really appreciated the comments earlier from Mr. Patrick Kennedy of the accountability of it didn't happen by accident that we have an inequitable system. It wasn't by accident that um, care in tribal communities and other historically oppressed, excluded um, communities that the mental health care and health care is less than. But this is our chance to fix it. We are building a new system. We have an opportunity for the first time in my lifetime of 50 years, and maybe the first time in yours too, we get to rebuild this crisis system. What does it look like? Um, let's set the bar really high. Um, the good news is that for a lot of these things that we need for equity, they don't cost money but they do take a concerted effort to shift attitudes, norms, and customs. You know, all the money in the world will not eliminate racism, will not 
eliminate transphobia, um, trans, you know, transphobia, homophobia. You know, I think of if we're going to make a system that is safe for all with 988, can my relatives, can a young 15 year old um, neurodivergent trans child call 988 and get the same quality of care as anyone else? Until that happens, we haven't hit our goal yet. And part of that is free. It costs nothing to treat our fellow human beings with dignity. Um, and this thing that I know with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, with trainings of their call specialists, this is built into the training. So on that, I know that when someone calls, they are met where they are at. Um, we need more. We need more training in that. It costs nothing to treat someone with respect, to respect their autonomy, to respect their ability to play the key role in building that pathway to care. If they had the ability to reach out and ask for help, we have the ability and obligation to meet them where they are at. And it costs nothing to treat people with respect um, and to treat people with compassion. Um, oftentimes, I, I've been seeing recently in the news um, how we're talking about victims of trauma and crime, and we're framing it in mental health. And I want us to take a pause. One with 988. I know that our qualified call takers across the country, um, as they are triaging with that caller to recognize, is this person traumatized and needing safety? Or is this person struggling for a mental health crisis? Those symptoms look very much the same, but we need to demand appropriate care. Um, someone, you know, I go to the grocery store in a historically black neighborhood that we have a beautiful store um, in what was a food desert for many years. My fellow shoppers and I have been anxious to go shopping um, after the shooting in Buffalo. This is not an increase of mental health issues. This is a safety issue um, and responding is different. Um, so as we build this system, you know, our young people going to school, yes, we need increased mental health at schools, but we also need our young people to live in a world where it is safe to go to school, where it is reasonable to assume that you're not going to get shot at school today. Um, so as we build out our system, we also build out a trauma-informed that is part of equitable because for many of the groups that we look at as being high risk or being underserved, misserved, they are high risk for being abused. They are high risk for experiencing trauma. They are high risk for having their rights violated, um, for being evicted because of who they have married of losing their job, of, you know, when we look at justice for all, there are many groups in society, including my populations of indigenous Americans, when we see anything for all Americans, we also see a little asterisk that says all but you. Um, it, when asked in meetings, um, one of my mentors, Dr. Dolores Bigfoot, we were in meetings at the national level and someone asked, how can we help communities of color um, know that they can call us, that they can trust us when they are in crisis? And Dr. Bigfoot got very quiet and she said, you need to be trustworthy. That's what you have to do. And I think for this system, there are some states and areas doing it really well. I've had the opportunity to tour um, some facilities from Brooklyn, New York, 
you know, to Phoenix, Arizona, where organizations are doing it right. They are meeting those mental health needs of everyone who walks in their doors. They're treating everyone with compassion. We need to replicate that across the country. And those of us who are advocating, those of us who have the ability to influence policy, we cannot stop. I call on all of you, do not stop until we achieve this goal. 988 will only be equitable if we make it so, if we demand it to be so, and we set measurable goals. We don't need this to be a dream. Um, we need you know, service for every American in crisis that they know they have a safe place to call. They have supportive people to respond, and they have a place to go that will treat them with dignity and respect. It is possible we must make it a reality. Shelby, I so appreciate your leadership in this space as well, how much you call upon measuring resiliency and strength as something that's really important. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question, if you could, before you know we say our thank you to you, is how do we evaluate equity if we get 988 right? You know, what does that look like, you can say, for your communities or indigenous communities that have been really underrepresented in our data, in our resources, because we're not measuring needs accurately? What does that look like for you if we can do this correctly? So I think the Kennedy Satcher Institute made a good step with the survey and the report you just put out. And I think one is we ask continually, not one time, but continually over the next five years. You know, SPRC is very proud to partner with SAMHSA on a formative research project that is going to be taking place um, over the next six months. Um, and hopefully we will continue to invest um, under my leadership, I will be investing some of our funds at SPRC of continually asking. We need to be asking individuals in those communities because the only ones who can tell us, I feel safe calling, I feel that my needs are going to be met, are those individuals in those communities. So each state, and that's going to look different. So maybe we help set up framework for each state to set up focus groups where you have these historically excluded um, and underserved groups. And we have to be willing to listen, um, be hum humble enough to let people call us out. That's the only way we can grow. If we cannot measure it, we cannot change it. And sometimes that means we have to have thick skin as we sit and we listen to people tell us how they were underserved by our system. Um, but until we can fix that, until we can listen and validate their experience, we cannot make it better in the future. So that's what I would recommend is that each state set up these boards where you have um, Black, Hispanic, non-English speaking, undocumented, Native American, suicide attempt survivors, suicide loss survivors, and many, many more on there and say, do you feel safe? Do you feel this is a service for you? And until we get the majority saying yes, our work is not done. I think that was really well articulated that sometimes the questions are simpler than more complex. And is this working is one that we can definitely start with. Thank you so much for taking the time today, Shelby, and for sharing your story and your culture, your heritage as well, your expertise, your leadership, and everything you're doing to advance equity in 988. I know this is the first of our collaboration together, and I really look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you for having me today. This brings us to the conclusion of this leadership convening. Um, I know that this was just the beginning, and there was so much that we wanted to cover that we couldn't simply because of time. But I do want to leave you with a few words and thoughts as we, as we think about what we do with what we learned today. 
Embedding equity into 988 is about saving lives, as we said earlier in our one-on-one -on -one with Dan Gilson. This is about ensuring that we don't hear stories anymore in the news about people who didn't get care they need and experienced trauma or death because the response they received was inadequate. Many communities have been met with so many different types of crisis, and this is really important for us to understand when it comes to equity. A crisis of poverty, a crisis of discrimination, a crisis of racism, a crisis of morality and isolation, a crisis of being misunderstood. We say the names of those who this effort to make 988 equitable should be in honor of. Lyndon Cameron, Antonio Martinez, Paul Castaway, Ricardo Munoz, Walter Wallace Jr., Eleanor Bumpers. This list goes on for way too long, and these are just a few names that we acknowledge. Someone in crisis needs to believe that there is life after crisis. 988 is our chance to make this list into one that celebrates people who recovered, who healed, who were able to get the help they needed and thrive after crisis. Our next order of business is to ensure that we are evaluating and measuring equity in 988's implementation. This effort for me has to be collective and collaborative, just as it was to inform the document that informed our summit today. We must think about how we disaggregate data and make it more inclusive and robust of actual experiences so resource allocation can be equitable. We must acknowledge the harm that certain policies create for certain communities and ensure that safety continues to be a priority for those in need. The Kennedy Satcher Center intends to continue to lead efforts to embed equity into 988, and we want you to be a part of it. If you've stayed with us for the past three hours and you're here now, here's my call to action. You will receive an invitation to complete a survey at the end of this event, which includes an opportunity to become involved in our work. That may be being outreach to participate in a regional convening, wherever you're located, to participate in a survey, to sit in a focus group, so that we in real time can tell the equity story that ensures 988 is a success in the next few years. I do hope as many of you as possible will decide to join us, just as much as many of you decided to stay with us for the entire summit today. Our communities and our neighbors need us. It's time to show up for each other and for them. Thank you to Beacon Health Options for your generous sponsorship of this initiative. Thank you to our speakers and panelists for sharing your knowledge and profound expertise with us. And most importantly for me, thank you to our audience for choosing today to be where you become a champion of equity. Your decision to join us today was an action in advancing equity, and we are grateful for you. Please follow us at Kennedy Satcher on Twitter, Satcher Health Leadership Institute on LinkedIn, and kennedysatcher.org for updates on our work. I wish you all health, safety, and wellness. Until next time, have a wonderful rest of your day.